Welcome to Mind, Body, Spirit, Food. I'm your host, Nikki Sizemore, and in this podcast, we'll explore the rituals, traditions, and cultural influences around food and how they connect us to our minds, our bodies, our spirits, the earth, and our communities. This is a space that's dedicated to bringing more presence, ease, and joy into the process of feeding ourselves. Let's dive in. Hello, and welcome back to the podcast. We are just a few weeks away from Thanksgiving. Oh my gosh. And today, so excited because I am talking holiday cooking with one of my very favorite food writers and educators, Molly Stevens. Molly is a James Beard award-winning author, cooking instructor, and recipe developer. Her cookbooks include All About Dinner, Simple Meals, Expert Advice, All About Roasting, and All About Braising. She's been named Cooking Teacher of the Year by both the International Association of Culinary Professionals and Bon Appetit Magazine, and she is a co-host of the Everything Cookbooks podcast. Molly and I explore how we can bring more ease into planning and prepping for holiday gatherings. We get into menu planning, prep tricks, cooking techniques, easy appetizers, timing dinner, and more. Molly offers such great advice, not just for cooking holiday meals, but also for preparing for them mentally and emotionally. For me, the holidays are truly one of my favorite times of the year, but the reality is that they can also be incredibly stressful. I think this conversation is going to help you clarify what you want this holiday season to feel like, why you cook for others, and how you can better align those two things, bringing more ease and flow into the season. As always, if this work resonates with you, an easy way you can support the podcast is by sharing it with your friends and family or on social media. That goes a long way. You can also rate it in your podcast app or leave a comment over there. And you can become a subscriber to the Mind, Body, Spirit Food newsletter where I share weekly recipes and my tips for bringing more presence, freedom, and joy into the kitchen. If you become a paid subscriber for just $5 a month, You fund this entire project, and I'm so grateful for you. All right, my friends, let's dive into the show. Hi, Molly. Welcome to the show. I'm so pleased to have you here. It's so good to see you. It's great to see you, Nikki. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Molly and I, we went to France together, actually. We did. (laughs) Years ago (laughs) for a press thing, and so it's been a long time, but... I absolutely love your work. And when I was thinking about who to ask on the show to talk about holiday cooking, you were the first name that popped into my head. So we're going to get into all of that. But before we do, I'm going to start by asking you the first question that I ask all of my guests. And that is, what is your cultural upbringing and how has that influenced your relationship to food? Huh. Well, that's a, that's a big question. It's a big one. It's mm-hmm. a big question. I grew up in the Northeast, in the urban Northeast, so in a Rust Belt city with a lot of family. Like, I come from a really big family. Grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins, and then beyond the family, the neighbors and mm. kids from school and down the street. And so it was a lot of people. And holidays, holidays were big. But even more than holidays, just mealtime was a mm-hmm. thing. I mean, I often joke that that I come from a family where we don't get up from one meal until we know what's happening for the next meal. <laughs> and that's kind of still true today in a way. So breakfast was on the fly. Lunch might be, although when I was in grade school, it was just it was public school, just a couple blocks from home. And so we would walk home for school and bring kids who had been bused to that school would walk home. So we'd have like, it was always a lot of different people around. And then when it comes to holidays, which I know we're going to talk a little bit about today or a lot about today, those were big family things, Mm -hmm. like whether they were the religious holidays or just the 4th of July and the Memorial Day, but everything revolved. We were too big of a crew to go out to restaurants. Yeah. And so it would be house to house. And I think Sort of growing up, we weren't restaurant people. We'd go out maybe twice a year for Mother's Day and my mom's birthday because it would be the whole cliche. And my sister and I was pretty gender normative Mm -hmm. upbringing where my sister and I would be called into service in the kitchen more than the boys would be. But how many siblings do you have? I have three siblings and they and are all still in the city I grew up in. No way. 
sending their kids to the schools we went to. I mean, oh, it's amazing. Yeah. And some of my cousins have moved away, but it's a lot. Yeah. They're all very dug into city life. Yeah. What was the kind of food? A lot of meat and potatoes. But when I was in high school, I guess before high school, my older brother and my mother, and I don't know who influenced who, but they got into Adele Davis, Diet for a Small Planet. Mm. So when we joined a local co-op, and I could still remember the smell of the co-op, wow. and we'd have to go, it was when you'd have to work at the co-op. Yeah. To, and this is the 70s, right? Like early 70s. Yeah, late 60s, early 70s. And we would have to work to shop there. And so mm-hmm. you'd be grinding peanut butter. And so my mom got into sort of this health food thing, but it was before we really understood it. And so... It, <laughs> She was very experimental. She'd like try mm. things out. I remember she'd have people over for dinner party and she'd try something she'd never made before. So she wasn't afraid to fail. And maybe that was something mm. she was adventuresome. But it was pretty standard meat and potatoes. I think we had the joy of cooking and a lot of sort of community cookbooks were around. And I still have some of her books. It was back when you cut out recipes from the magazines. Yeah. And, but it was pot roast and soups. and Yeah, that's very similar to my upbringing as well. So fast forward, I mean, you are an acclaimed cookbook author, culinary teacher, speaker. What made you decide to go into the food world? I had been working in kitchens just to have spending money during high school and worked with a caterer. And it was just kind of the work I liked to do. Mm-hmm. And like, I remember trying retail, like, clothes. I was not good at that. And (laughs) I tried front of the house and I wasn't great at that. And I just, I got into the kitchens and I really liked it. And so I did work during college and, and then I got two degrees in English. I have a college degree in English and then I went and got a master's degree in English, but I didn't have a career. I didn't Mm -hmm. know what I was going to do. And cooking didn't seem like something that a well-educated young woman should do. Yeah. I remember my father was trying to encourage me to become a teacher or do copywriting. And so I just, I went to France. I ran, I kind of ran away a little bit. I borrowed some money and bought a one-way ticket to France when I was 23. Did you have a plan? Was food involved in that decision or you just go into France? Food was involved because I was working in restaurants and I remember having this baguette that somebody, or I didn't even know it was a baguette, but this loaf of bread that I'd never had anything like it before in my life. It was Mm. just... Like, I just, I remember buying it. I was living in Vermont at the time with some friends from college. And I remember buying this loaf of bread and just like tearing into it. And I'd never had anything like that in my life. It was, Mm. it's like, what? I think I ate the whole thing sitting there in the seat of my broken down sob. It's very (laughs) cliche. And then there was a guy who was growing these amazing tomatoes. And I went Mm. and talked to him. And I talked to the baker. I tracked down the baker who made this bread. And I was baking at the time in this little hippie cafe. (laughs) <laughs> and both those people told me about France. Oh, interesting. And I'd never been abroad. I didn't know. I mean, I certainly knew what where France was, but I didn't yeah. have any great ambition to travel at that point. I just felt like signs were pointing me there. And so I went and I'd never like, beyond the bread, I'd never had like cheese. You yeah. and I, we ate a lot of cheese when we were in France. We like did. <laughs> and I got over there and I was just blown away. I'd never had cheese like that. I'd never seen a culture like that. And it was, I still remember the feeling of feeling like it was a homecoming for me. It was just, there was something about that I could just care about food and talk about food and have friends that we sat around and talked about food. And so it just really changed for me. And this was, so now we're into the early 80s and the culture around food was starting to change in the U.S. And it just felt like a really good time. So I stayed for a couple of years and then came back here and never looked back, as they say. Yeah, it's so interesting because my experience in France, I studied abroad in France in college, mm-hmm. and that was my first time spending time in France. And it was the same feeling when you said it was a homecoming. That's exactly how I felt. Yeah. I mean, the first time I went to the market in Aix-en-Provence where I studied, they had the outdoor market. I had this distinct feeling, A, that I had been there before. Just yes. kind of that sense of like, oh, wait, yes. this is me. This is yes. me. Yes. And I had in the Midwest, I had never had dreamed of that was a reality. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah, that's what kind of broke open food for me was that yeah. experience as well. Yeah. So we're talking about the holidays today yeah. because we're into November here when this is going to air. One of my favorite 
times of year. But I want to get back to, you mentioned briefly about the holidays with your family. They were big events. What did those look like for you? How many people did your parents host? What was the menu like? Yes, my parents sometimes hosted Thanksgiving. I know Christmas we would go to different, we, I think we had three different places we'd have to go, like different grandparents. And so I, I believe Thanksgiving that we took turns. And then I know my sister has hosted Thanksgiving still to this day. And wow. it would be 40, 50, I wow. think. Yeah. That's yeah. a big group. Yeah, a big group. I mean, little kids, but not all adults, but still. It's a big group. Yeah. 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 And traditional big turkeys. <laughs> yeah. Lots of sides, heavy tables. It's interesting because you, I mean, just from working with you kind of tangentially at events and stuff, you have a real knack for serving a lot of people. I don't know mm -hmm. if this comes from your catering background. Do you think this is tied to growing up with having, I mean, obviously if you're serving 40 people at a holiday party, that is not a small endeavor. That's a massive amount of food. Yeah. I, it's funny. I've never thought about that, but I love it. I mean, there's something about cooking for other people and I worked in restaurants for a little bit and it's not where I was meant to be, <laughs> but catering always sort of events and mm -hmm. like gearing up for one big event. And also the changing, like one day it'll be slow and one day it'll be busy kind of thing, you know, if you're doing, as opposed to restaurant where it's that constant grind. And so th there's just, there's a certain adrenaline too mm. about making it all, bringing it all together. Yeah, I just really, I just love it. So speaking about that, I want to get into some dishes in a bit. But right now, let's start by talking about some of the tips. I mean, you, obviously, you are well skilled in throwing events and parties and cooking for a massive amount of people. And I feel like the holidays, this is what gets people. This yeah. is what catches people up is like, how do we, what are some tricks? And I'll have some specific questions for you. But what are some tricks that we can provide to help people bring more ease into this idea of cooking for the holidays? Yeah. I'm going to start by talking about menu planning because mm -hmm. I love man menu planning. Yeah. And for me, that's a joy, but I know for a lot of people that is not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you, what are some thoughts that you have about this, about planning your meal for the holidays? I love that we're talking about this and that this is part of what you do with your work now, Nikki, I think it's so important because it's now more than ever where we're seeing all these beautiful mm. tablescapes and dishes and you pick up your phone and you see everybody else's gorgeous life. And mm. it's just, it's a little yeah. overwhelming sometimes and we're all trying to keep up, but it's important to remember why we're doing it, mm. why we're celebrating, inviting people over, going to someone's house. Like, that's why I think so many people say they love Thanksgiving because it's just about the meal and it doesn't have all the other overtones of some of the other holidays yeah. kind of thing. But it's about the gathering or not. I mean, if you're a small group, too. And so it was wonderful growing up with these big groups. But I think a small mm -hmm. group is also like sometimes less stressful, obviously, yeah. smaller. But I would say to remember why you're doing it. I love that. Yeah. And I think it's not always easy because I feel that often people do it because they have to. There's an obligation mm. around it. Mm -hmm. And that's really tricky. And I don't know, I can't sit here and pretend to help people through that because that's everybody's own journey. I mean, I know yeah. we've probably all had holidays or events that we've felt that we were obligated to go to and we don't want to go to or yeah. obligated to host and we don't want to. But if there's a way to work through that, like... Why are yeah. we doing this? Well, you've got to go to X family member and you really don't want to be with that group of people. I think that's just hard. It is very hard. Yeah. The other thing that's really hard around the holidays, and I think this one still catches me by surprise, is how, especially I think as we get older, how often the holidays just remind us of the people that aren't there anymore. Yeah. And to emotionally prepare yourself for that ahead of time. Mm. because sometimes it catches me. Like I said, it still catches me up. I won't be thinking about it. And yeah. then I'll be there in the middle of whatever. And suddenly I just become overwhelmed with the fact that I miss my dad or, you know, yeah. something like that. Yeah. And I think spending a little time mm. in advance to emotionally say, okay, 
if you're fortunate or unfortunate, which however you see it enough to be gathering with family, but you know that there are going to be people who aren't there or that yeah. you have friends. Let's talk about Thanksgiving. You have a Friendsgiving and you used to do it with all these friends and now you're only doing it with these friends or you've moved yeah. away and you're someplace else. I mean, I think it's like, we're supposed to be so happy because it's yeah. the holidays and sometimes the holidays are so it's damn so hard. It's hard, yeah. Right? Yeah. Hi there. I just wanted to pop in really quickly and let you know that an easy way that you can support this work is to sign up for the Mind, Body, Spirit, Food newsletter. In the weekly newsletter, you'll get brand new recipes each week, along with my thoughts, ideas, and practical tips for how to bring more ease and joy and freedom into the kitchen. The newsletter is free, although if you become a paid subscriber for just a couple bucks a month, you'll have access to the full recipe archive, along with Q&As, weekly threads, and other fun perks. And if you're already a subscriber, thank you. You can share the newsletter with your friends or even give a gift subscription. I've popped a link into the show notes where you can sign up. Thank you all for listening. And now back to the show. This is so brilliant, Molly, because I feel like my question was about like logistics, food. And actually, I know what. No, no, no. But this is what you're saying is that, OK, before you get there, even yeah. it's about the emotional preparation. Yeah. And I just think that's so smart because we First of all, I think the holidays are a time when we need to check our expectations. At Absolutely. Least. I mean, this is something I learned as a kid early on. If right. I was expecting <laughs> like this magic experience, yeah. I was always let down every Absolutely. time. Yep. So to check those expectations and then also to really look into those obligations. And sometimes those obligations are things that we can't get out of, right. but sometimes they are. And sometimes mm -hmm. it takes an honest conversation to say, I just don't have it in me to host this year and to yep. be honest with yourself and to be honest with the people yep. around yep. you. But I think this is so smart, like emotionally prepare first. And yeah. if we can bring that into the holiday season, then we can give ourselves the boundaries and the space and maybe the time, the quiet, the time for the grief so that maybe it doesn't bubble up as often at the yep. party. And if it does, that's okay too. But yep. right. very smart. Right. But because otherwise, and I think the logistics, it's so easy to get caught in the logistics. Yeah. And to use that, I know I've done it, is, is a distraction. Mm. And just like, okay, I've got to do this. Yes. I've got to pl I plan this menu like overly ambitious because I'm just going to be the superstar. Done that. Yeah. And that's why I think that if you sort of do a little check first and figure out mm. where you are, how you're doing, are you 100% on board for this? Do you want to go full in? Do you want to devote, you know, and then figure out what sort of energy emotionally and, you know, physically, that spiritually that you have to give to the day and then plan according to that too. Mm, so smart. And then the next thing is like, make your list, make your menu. I mean, I think I could sum up all of my <laughs> tips into lists, list, yeah. list, list, list. I mean, it's a prep list. It's a menu list. It's a shopping list. It's all those things. And what I say, especially with the menu is cross something off, mm -hmm. write your menu and then like do it ahead if you can, and then start crossing things off because mm -hmm. less is more, but it's easy to do too much. Yeah. Oh, and for people like you and me who are doers, yep. the doing is absolutely the distraction because mm -hmm. then I don't have to sit and right. like right. feel. <laughs> but maybe that's the plan. Maybe you're like, you yeah. know what, this is just going to be so, for whatever reason, you aren't into it. Maybe you just want it to be overwhelmingly and have be so yeah. busy that you can't. And if that's your plan, that's your plan. As long as you're intentional as going into it. As long as you're it. intentional. Yeah. As long as that's yeah. your intention. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I'm a major list maker. Anybody who knows me knows this about me. But especially for Thanksgiving, we're hosting this year. And it's all about that. It's all about yeah. the list. And it's very satisfying to then knock things out. There's so much you can do in advance right. that people Absolutely. don't realize that you yep. can do in advance. I mean, and sometimes that's even for me chopping a bunch of vegetables one evening when it feels fun or yep. buying the already peeled garlic containers. Sometimes the grocery stores do that for you if you know you're going to be going through mm -hmm. a lot of garlic. But mm -hmm. the list making is so interesting. In fact, we were just at a family reunion and was really overcome by the hospitality of my husband's cousins who hosted us. They nice. did it so seamlessly. I'm such an introvert, believe it or not. I don't like hosting huge parties at all, but 
I learned a lot from them because they made it seem so seamless. But A, his cousin's wife had put out all of the platters with sticky notes of everything that was going to go on it. And we weren't eating for a while, but when it came time to eat, we all just started throwing the stuff on the platters because everyone knew what was going where. And maybe half of the stuff was homemade and the other stuff was store-bought. And that also, to me as a cook, I have to check myself because I want to cook everything from scratch. And I'm like, that's when things stop being fun to give Mm -hmm. yourself the out Mm -hmm. to be like, you know what, let's just get this from the store, get this from a local purveyor, whatever it is, but take some of the load off. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. I love that. Both of those tips to figure out your serving dishes ahead and yeah, sticky notes are are brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And ask for help too. Say you plan a menu and it's like, this is too much. Those family gatherings I grew up in, they're potluck, but with the caveat that the host would be cooking, say, the turkey, or if people had their dishes that they made, mm. and the host might do the most of it, but other people had assignments. Okay. And I, yeah. I, I think that's a really, especially if you, I mean, I'm lucky I have good cooks and on both sides of my family, lots of good cooks. And so, you know, it's easy to say, hey, could you bring a side dish? Could you yeah. bring a salad? Could you make this? But even if they're not great cooks, let them bring something. Maybe they'll stop off and get it as you say, the local purveyor, Mm -hmm. or maybe they'll bring it and it's not the best in the world, but it's okay. It's really okay. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. it's really dropping that. I have talked about this all the time, but dropping those notions of perfectionism, that it doesn't have to be perfect. It just let it be messy. (laughs) Let it be what it is. Yeah, yeah. What kind of prep do you do ahead? Say you're hosting Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner. What kind of prep would you get done ahead of time? So especially if there's a turkey, I think turkey broth to make a turkey mm. broth ahead of time, like you can make it a couple of weeks ahead of time when it's such a key for me for a successful Thanksgiving or any holiday where you have turkey because you can use it for the gravy, you can use it for the stuffing. It's like money in the bank. I'll make it two weeks, a month ahead of time, whatever I can get around right. to it. And then if I'm traveling, I freeze it in quart deli containers and uh-huh. then I use those to keep my cooler, those oh, ice packs yeah. in my cooler. But just to show up or to have a couple quarts of turkey broth to me just is like ensures I'm going to get a great gravy. Yeah. I can have extra stuffing because I don't tend not to put the stuffing in the turkey. Right. But even if you do, there's not going to be enough. People are going to want more stuffing. Yeah. So if you have a turkey broth to moisten your stuffing, it's going to taste like it cooked in the bird. Anyway, so that's one of my one of my big ones. And then obviously figure out where you're getting your turkey, if it's a turkey, mm. or if you're doing a roast beef or any big center protein, you got to figure out where you're getting it ahead of time. Yeah. Whether you buy it ahead of time or not, but you need to either order it or know where you're getting it. Or if you're buying a frozen one, get it in your freezer and get it defrosted. But figuring out those two pieces, I think, are really important. I love that about the turkey broth. I've never thought to do that well in advance, just to yeah. buy some turkey parts. I'm assuming that you just buy, Absolutely. yeah, and then you Legs just and whip thighs. broth. Yep. Yep. yep, that's so smart. I love making pies. Pies are my mm-hmm. favorite thing. So I think probably make the pie dough a month or two in advance. I just yeah. stash a bunch in the freezer because having that done just feels, even though making pie dough actually isn't hard, I'm going to argue with people about that, but yeah, having that too, already yeah. done is yes. a huge leg up. And I do that. Absolutely. I do that far in advance. Yeah. yeah. Now, what about day before? What kind of, you know, I try to plan a lot of dishes that I can actually almost entirely execute ahead of time so that on the holiday itself, I'm not going crazy. But do you have any actual prep tips around that about, you know, little things that people can do that might seem maybe insignificant, but that can add up big time on a holiday? Absolutely. I mean, so I love your chopping vegetables one. Like if you're going to have chopped vegetables for your stuffing or, you know, have them chopped and you could do that a day or two. You know, we're talking onions, carrots, celery. Yeah. They can sit, right? Mm-hmm. Washing herbs and lettuce, having all that stuff mm-hmm. cleaned. And because that's the kind of thing that takes up a lot of room and in the kitchen makes a mess. You got water everywhere, whatever. So anything, all the vegetables trimmed, if they're not chopped, trimmed, washed. Mm-hmm. If you're doing some sort of green vegetable, green beans are classic. I will often have them trimmed and topped, if not blanched ahead of time. Mart. And then there's a million ways to warm them up and finish them off. If you are following recipes, read all the recipes and see it, are there any, can something be blanched? And then if we are talking turkey or any, again, any big animal protein, I will have brined it 
done some sort of spice rub mm-hmm. a couple days ahead. And I'm big on dry brining for yeah. all sorts of reasons. And one of the great ones is that it just takes up less room. So explain what dry brining is, just in case the listener is like, wait, what are you talking about? It's salting it, just yeah. <laughs> seasoning it. It's just salting it, really, it is. But we all remember those, you know, ambitious cooks listening that, you know, we brining our turkeys where we put them into clean coolers and giant yeah. pots and have all this water <laughs> sloshing around. And it was just a, the idea is that you have a more moist turkey this way, but just seasoning it in and out. And then figuring out who you're cooking for and how much does tradition matter mm. to you if you're hosting or to whoever's organizing. And if it's paramount, then that's what you got. Mm-hmm. You've got these are the foods we always had. But if it's not, and you have some room, consider you don't have to do, you know, everything the grandma did. Right? Yeah. So along that line, one of I mean, the best way, if you want to like really have an easy time with your turkey, cut it apart, yeah. break it down. I do this every year. And if you do that, you can actually braise the dark meat. You could do that ahead. You could yeah. do that two, two, three days ahead, and then you could roast the breast the day of. Yeah, I always break it down. And if you're intimidated by breaking down a turkey into the breast, the thighs, the drumstick, you can have a butcher do it. If you have a good butcher, Absolutely. you can have your butcher yeah. do it. But yeah. I, I was just talking to my husband about this yesterday because it's time for us. We're at the point now where we need to order the turkey from our local butcher. Right. And he was like, how are you going to do it? And I was like, well, I'm going to do something different this year, but I'm absolutely going to break it down. Because yep. to me, you're right. You can braise the thighs. You're not waiting. And it gives me more. I only have one oven. So right. that way it cooks a lot faster yep. and more evenly. And you can ensure that you get that super juicy breast yep. meat because it's yep. not overcooked by the time the thighs yep. and legs cook through. Now, in the past, I haven't been able to do that. Well, we've had two turkeys. And so what I would do would be break down one of them. But okay. I had to leave one because the carving, because oh, the ritual of yeah, carving ritual. was too important. And I totally appreciate that. And it's super fun because when it's time to carve, mm. some of the younger generation will come in and that, you know, I have some of my favorite pictures from Thanksgiving are some of my nieces and nephews standing around <laughs> learning how to carve. Yep. And just thinking about that too. You yeah. learn from your husband's cousin about the sticky notes on the yeah. platters. Also, who's doing what? Like if it's a big group. Like, oh, smart. We've all been there where it's like, okay, will someone please come carve? And everybody's off watching the football game yeah. or they're sitting in the, <laughs> they've had too much wine and they can't yeah. carve. Or, like figuring that out too. Mm, to assign because some you, tasks. Yeah. Well, that is, it's like that communication. And you're right. That just makes things seamless when I communicate. I'm actually laughing mm-hmm. because sometimes I forget to do this because I think I can do everything. And right. yet it's more fun. If I'm like, okay, even to my girls, you girls are in charge of the table and they will get so into it. They will go That's outside, great. they'll hunt for leaves. Yeah. I'm not a big decorator, but I love pulling stuff from nature and I love giving that task to somebody else even right. more than I love doing it myself. Right, right. <laughs> that thing where you end up standing in the kitchen by yourself. Yeah, yeah looking exactly. around and you're like, how did this wait, happen? Wait, wait. And it's not that, to take all the blame for it, but I think we have to take some responsibility. If we yes. find ourselves standing in the kitchen all by ourselves and feeling put upon by it, okay, then do we something. need to communicate. Yeah. yeah. I want to talk about appetizers because appetizers are like sacred in my family for Christmas, especially. In fact, we yes. skip lunch and we just do a spread of appetizers yes. and my yes. brothers are in charge of that part and they make the same things every year. That is where tradition falls in hard. Like if yeah. my brother Chris does not make my grandma's shrimp dip, there will be a price to pay. Right, right. No, I get that. Yes, yeah. (laughs) But I feel like appetizers are kind of stressful because I want to offer the guests something delicious when they Mm -hmm. walk in the door. And it's the kind of thing that appetizers can end up taking up so much time. Right. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that needs to happen for a holiday meal. What are some tricks, tips, recipes, ideas for simplifying that? Before I answer that, I do want to say I love that about breakfast and lunch because... I think on Thanksgiving, I mean, it depends on what time you eat. We, I feel like every year we have a conversation about what time we're going to eat. Yes. It's like, how do we always have this conversation? Yes. It's like, and some people want to eat later, some people want to eat earlier, mm-hmm. but it's always well into the afternoon, evening. And I think lunch should be just, if you want a bowl of Fruit Loops, you should have that. But yeah. you know, not be 
responsible for lunch. Like people should figure it out because you want people. Yeah. Depending on how late it is, maybe if it's a house party, you might have a breakfast together. But lunch should be often the kitchen is even off limits at that point. Yes. Just figure it out. But appetizers, I think, are really tricky around the holidays because I know a lot of people give themselves license to overeat at the holidays. But I also, if I'm in charge or helping with a really big meal, I don't want a ton of heavy appetizers. So yeah. I'm like not for a cheese board in most cases. What I love is a really sort of robust crudite. Mm. So lots of crunchy, fresh, but also including pickles and maybe some stuffed peppers. And again, things you oh, can find smart. at a nice deli. Some maybe some charcuterie in there, but just sort of a lot of little spicy and Nashi things. I love that. And that's going to stoke the appetite instead of like getting you all full before the turkey hits the table or whatever. Right. But it's funny. You have shrimp dip. We have crab dip dip. So uh-huh. that, you know, has to have the crab dip. Yep. And then the other thing that I've, since we've started buying these beautiful farm fresh turkeys, I don't remember a decade ago or something or longer, went to clean it or get it ready to salt it. And there's these gorgeous turkey livers. Mm. that were in with the yeah gibble, do you say giblets or giblets i never I know i never know <laughs> <laughs> if it makes me be- feel better that you don't either I know. So. <laughs> I, anyway so but you know in with the neck and you don't want to put those into the broth and so i've started to make a turkey liver pate oh stop that with, is chicken liver pate is like one of my favorite things exactly. ever i've and never thought to do it with turkey liver it, so good. And you can make that a couple of days ahead, of course, too. Yeah. But if you have super fresh turkey livers. The other thing that I think is a really nice thing and, and a thing to do ahead is either a cheese straw or a cheese coin mm. or just mm. a little. I mean, it's I'm talking homemade, but you could also buy them. But just yeah. kind of it's like a cracker that has enough flavor in it that it's just a little tray of crackers kind of thing, right? Yeah. So it doesn't have to be cheese. Because the trouble with cheese and crackers is that people, I find, you keep putting cheese on your crackers because it's so good, right? Yeah. So it's a way to kind of make the cracker a little bit more of a bite unto itself. Well, and that's such a smart idea. And you're just reminding me, I used to make those all the time and I haven't. But I would keep the logs of dough in the freezer. And that way, again, it's like the pie dough. You could do that well in advance. And then yep. it's just like something special and delicious without yes. much effort, especially if you do it a month ahead of time. It right. feels like no effort, right. but it's a little special and Absolutely. a little. Absolutely. And if yeah. you're, if you're wine people and you have a little, like often people have a little glass of champagne or something to start yeah. with, they're perfect with something like yeah. that, or a little white wine or something just a little light and bright is really a nice way to start. Just awesome. peak the appetite. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Another question, because this is a question I get a lot, and I'm curious to hear your response, is about timing. A lot of people get very stressed out about timing yeah. a meal. I have strong opinions about this, but I'm curious to hear what you have to what you have to say. You mean getting it all, yeah. making it all happen at once? Back to the lists, mm-hmm. <laughs> agreeing on what time the meal is going to happen, and then. I wrote about this in my last cookbook about hot food being, I don't want to say overrated, but that's my answer. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't that's have to I be say. hot. Yeah, it doesn't. Ha- I mean, that's yeah. why you want the gravy. The gravy should be hot. Gravy the turkey be hot. does not have to be hot. The turkey yeah. needs to have rested. I mean, you don't want it cold. Yeah. But warm. If you're having a soup, I mean, some people, depending on the size of your group and your setting and stuff, a first course of a soup, of course, your soup should be hot. Yeah. There's certain things that, unless it's a chilled soup, but in the wintertime, probably not. But <laughs> that is my, yeah, Nikki, you were 100% on that, that it's okay if things... Have, the green beans can be at room temperature. Absolutely. The casseroles can be sitting and they're still going to be warm when yes. they come out of the oven. They're still yes. going to be warm. But I feel like people get really caught up on the timing thing and it's just, it doesn't have to be piping hot. And the mashed potatoes, I do like hot, but I put them in a bowl over a pot of barely simmering water, cover it with plastic wrap, and it keeps them warm and they don't that's get a, all hard that's and an clumpy. Old fine cooking tip. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Figuring out things and that's part of your list making. You might even go through and put a star next to things that you really want to be warm mm-hmm. or that have priority. And then the others, because a lot of us only have one oven, it's just impossible. Yeah. And is too much juggling around. And so just figure out, okay, we're going to, the gravy's going to be hot. The mashed potatoes, I'm going to keep them warm in the 
as you said, the double boiler, that's a brilliant tip and it works really well. And then the rest room temperature is fine. Yeah. 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 That's also sliding into dessert here. I never like to make, I mean, especially on the holidays, the desserts have to be done. There's after a big meal, I've had several glasses of wine. I am kind of ready just to relax. There's no way I'm going to go make more stuff. So pies, trifles. I make a gingerbread trifle at Christmas, which is one of my favorite things in the world. so good, yeah. But all of those things can be done. The trifles can be done the day before. The pies, I'll make the pumpkin pie the day before. Apple pie goes in the, you know, I'll do that in the morning, the day of, just because I like the crust better fresh that Mm -hmm. day. But Mm -hmm. yeah, the desserts, I think. It's funny you say that about pumpkin pie. And I'm just thinking, because I agree, pumpkin pie the day before, absolutely. (laughs) It's funny, it's such a classic Thanksgiving pie. And I think it's, I don't want to say better, but absolutely every bit is good, and if not better, the next day. So yeah. take them out of the fridge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and part of our impetus for making the pumpkin pie the day before is we always have a slice the day before. <laughs> but we always, I love it. I mean, especially if it's just my family, maybe my, my husband's parents, you know, if it's small, then we're like, we don't need two pies for just right. six of us on Thanksgiving. Like, let's dive into this as a I little celebratory. It. I love it. <laughs> we're big pie oh. for breakfast the next day. Oh, that, yeah. 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 And that brings me to my last question is like, when we're hosting the day before. This is always like kind of what catches me up is that I feel like, oh man, okay, it's the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. People are coming to stay with us. Right. I have to cook a meal then too. What are some easy things you would turn to? I mean, takeout is completely viable. Pizza, go for the pizza, I'd say 100%. But are there any kind of throw together things that you would turn to if you were going to make something? That is a sort of a lasagna and a salad night mm. kind of thing or a chili. Maybe you want a vegetarian chili because you're going to have a big heavy meal the next day or something. That to me is a, a casserole and a salad or a pot of stew and a salad. Well, I feel like people are going to get so much out of this conversation. I hope that for you all listening You can take some of these tips that Molly gave you and just bring some more ease to remember to emotionally prepare to check in. Why are you doing it? Yeah. (laughs) I think that's so smart. And also to make time when you're making the list and your plan, like lists include the schedule, like what's happening when kind of thing. But make a break for a walk or a nap or a something. Just get out of that kitchen for a little bit, a shower, whatever it is that you need to reset. And even if the kitchen is a disaster and everything's late, just still take that time out, get out of there, do something, take a breath. And if even the day of you're like, you know what? I'm not making the caramel sauce for the apple pie. Just not going to make it. Yep. Save the butter and the sugar for something else. There. I love it. Well, I've got one more question for you. But before I jump into that, where can people find you? Probably most everything is linked on my website, which is Molly Stevens Cooks. And on Instagram, it's M Stevens Cooks. But that's where you can find me. Ah, Well, thank you so much. I've got one more question. And that is another question I ask all of my guests. And if it was your last meal on earth right now, what would it be? That's such a hard question. <laughs> I always tell people my answer will probably change in an hour. So it's like, it's, yeah. it doesn't have to be the end all, but like in this moment, what would it be? It is a very in hard this question. this moment, it's a very hard question. I mean, we've just been having all this Thanksgiving talk and everything, but it's sort of making me crave something that I either crave before or after a big holiday, but is a, a noodle soup. A spicy mm-hmm. Southeast Asian, like a pho or that mm-hmm. type of thing. Mm. That's a little slurpy, a little spicy. Yeah. Very warm. Warm and tingly, both heat and spice. Oh. I think I think that's what I'm going to nourish myself with. I think that sounds incredibly nourishing yeah. and delicious. Yeah. And now I just want all the things. <laughs> all the things. I know. <laughs> this makes me very hungry. So, um, well, But thanks so much. Thank you so much, Molly. Thank you so much for listening. If this work resonates with you in any way, you can support it by leaving a review or comment or sharing it with friends. Also, you can sign up for the newsletter, Mind, Body, Spirit, Food, and by becoming a paid member for just $5 a month, you help fund this entire project. Thank you so much to all of you who are already subscribed, especially to those paid subscribers. This work could not happen without you. 
I'm Nikki Sizemore. And as always, remember to nourish yourself with intention and love.